Hey everybody, welcome back. This is video number three of the Concourse 14 valve clearance and adjustment if necessary video. Thank God, boy that's a mouthful. But anyway, what we're gonna do in this video is pick up where we left on number two. Uh, I said, I think I said that we were going to uh, start barring the motor over, which we're gonna do, and that's just done right from right there. I'll explain the whole thing. And then we'll clock the cams using the service data by you know lining up the marks, checking the marks up here, there's one in fact right there. It is a paint mark, but there's actually a stamp dot in there. You'll see it later. I'm going to talk to you about it. And then we'll uh, make a determination after measuring the clearance or the valve lash, whatever you want to call it, and uh, decide whether we need to pull cams. And if we do, which ones and which shims need to be replaced, etc. So that's going to be fun. Not. All right. So let's get to the video and I hope you enjoy. Here is the uh, place we're gonna bar the motor over. I've got that cover off, as I said before, and you can tell what I mean by that O-ring seal. It's got a machined groove on the flat of the cover, and then the O-ring sits slightly proud of the cover and then seals that thing off. Uh, I think I may have used uh, gasket goo on it. There is uh, most likely a, I have to look it up in the service data, but certainly whenever you have a, a penetration, <laughs> love that word, uh, in a cover like that, uh, whether it's you know one of these covers or a timing uh, stator cover, rather, you're going to want um, gasket goo on it. That's most likely where that comes from. The other thing that you want to get gasket goo on is where you have the half of a crankcase, like a split. So you'd want to dab some on there. I see a little remnants of it here and here. In fact, we're going to use this one over here, I believe it is, for our mark um, to line up for timing. Let me review that in the service data, but I'm pretty sure that's what they said. So I got the plugs out, as I said, the holes are filled with uh, just some, you know, paper towel loosely stuffed in there. And so now we're gonna get to the point where we turn the motor over, we, we bar the motor over by hand. That tooth wheel has an arrow indicating uh, direction of rotation. So it's clockwise from the right side of the bike. You see that? Uh, some machines don't have that. And uh, whether it's on the uh, rotor side of the charging system or whatever pickup side, if you're completely unsure and it's unclear in the service data, uh, before you disconnect a battery or take any, you know, tension off a valve, you know, cam chain or anything like that, all you gotta do is bump the starter and watch this turn. So if, if we were to do that now, you know, of course it would be turning this way. So that's just one way you can you can uh, solve that issue if you're unclear. There is a procedure on, in 226 on uh, how to check the valve clearances and which ones to check at which particular clocking. Now. Um, some motorcycles, when I've done this, you actually use the one in four and the two in three mark, wherever that's located uh, as designed on the motorcycle for doing that particular job. In this case, you can see there's a two in three right there to the right and a one in four to the left. This does not use the two in three, as I said, it only uses the one in four. So you're putting it on one in four and then 360 degrees on one in four again, and then you check you check these valves and these valves, the valves that are indicated in black. There are marks on the cams that kind of give you the idea of which way they are pointed. In other words, are they pointed away from each other? You know, this way, away and away, or are they pointed towards each other with it being the center? Um, that dot right there is a paint dot, of course, but there's a stamp dot in there and there's a stamp or a, uh, engraved some sort of line on this one. So these are in a position of being apart right now or of opposite each other, all right? So if you look at this, these, these are apart at the one and four and these are together and then you check those particular valves. I don't necessarily like to do it that way. Um, I, I probably will, but how I normally do it is I bring it up on top dead center, a particular valve that I'm working on. So at number one, I watch number one intake valve open and close and kind of show the position of checking it right and wrong, but I crank it over, you know, by hand until number one intake opens and closes and then bring it up till I hit one and four on that crank mark. And then I know that I'm in top dead center on number one. Then I check number one and do two, three, and four the same way. That's the way I'm gonna do it. And I may do it this way too, but we'll see what the results are. But I kind of just wanted to explain how I do it. And uh, we may do it this way as well. 
And there you can see it says um, one and four. I know it's kind of hard to see. Let me get the light dimmed down a little bit. One and four, and it's what you do is you line it up to that line right there, which is the seam of the crankcase. It is the next day, and I don't remember where I left off. <laughs> I do have um, some of this editing in the can already, but I'll probably have to take a look at that. But I just want to ask you a question. You know what time it is? Time to make the donut. Time to make the donut. No, it's not time for that. It is time to check the valve clearances and make a determination whether or not we're going to have to pull these cams. So I'm going to go over a couple things about that and use the service data to illustrate uh, you know, one way that the service manual says to do it and another way, which is the way I do it. So let me show you that real quick. All right, so there's two ways to do this. And I'll show you the service manual way first, and I'll show you my way second. Here's service manual. This is page 2-26 in maintenance procedure, trouble valve clearance check. All right, so what they have you do essentially is to check all 16 valves in two crank rotations, both on the one and four mark. So you're gonna start with one, one and four location when you crank it around, and the other one in four location. And you really don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to the location of the cam lobes. What you need to pay attention to is the cam timing marks on the end of the cams and in which direction they are facing. And I mentioned this before, they'll either be facing at each other or away from each other. So essentially you rotate it to one in four when these marks are facing away from each other and you check all of number four number three exhaust, number two intake, and then the other way around. So 360 degree rotation back to one and four brings these marks next to each other or at each other. And then you check all of number one, two exhaust, three intake. And that takes care of all your 16 valves, all right? Now it certainly is one way to do it, but I'll show you the way I do it. And I think it's a little easier way because this can get a little confusing because you know, you have to note a left and a right valve on a particular side, whether it's left intake number two, right intake number two, and so forth. And that can get confusing. So what I end up doing is I rotate around utilizing the one in four and the two three mark. And I watch the cam lobes rotate around when they hit the intakes uh, valve and open it up and close it. Now I'm on the compression stroke and I bring it up to the mark depending on what you know cylinder I'm on. If I'm on two and three, I use the two, three mark. If I'm on one and four, I use the one and four mark, of course. Right now we're set up in a one, four top dead center, which um, has the marks opposite each other. If you come over here, you're capable of checking all of four, which would be correct. And then the ones I mentioned before. So you can do it this way, but the way I do it is, and other people do it as well, just having a discussion on, on, on the book of face uh, with a fellow who does a lot of these uh, on one of the uh, Concourse 14 pages and uh, the groups and he I asked him a couple questions because I was just kind of curious and he said yeah he does it the way where he rotates it around top dead center essentially he does top dead center one two then four and then three and the only reason why he does that is when you finish up with two four is ready to come around on its intake stroke like the, the cam lobe is right there so you just rotate it a little bit further it's a convenience thing only uh, you could certainly rotate it around to the next uh, uh, top dead center for three which is right in there and then line it up to two and three so he does one two four and then three and and, and that's fine and what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you just on one valve how we do that uh, rotate it around top dead center. Show, I'm going to show you one because you can see the end of the cam lobes a lot better. And then show, show checking that one. And then I'm going to check all the rest and we'll go over the results. I'm sorry about the uh, clutch line here, but it's steel, of course, and I can't bend it. But you get a pretty good shot of number one. We are at top dead center on number one. We know that because I look at it on the marks and I, like I said, I saw the intake valve come around. So it went around this way, came up, and then went over to top dead center. And the other thing you know, you'll know, you note is every cam sets of lobes at top dead center when you check them are gonna be like that, if you do it this way. If you do it the service manual way, they may, they may be in different positions. It doesn't really matter though, because the, this is the base circle of the uh, cam right there, of that particular lobe, that's the base circle. As long as you're measuring on the base circle, then you're fine. And, and that's why they can do it that way, because even when these things are clocked a little bit differently than you see here, um, as long as the uh, base circle is 
the area um, that is uh, you know parallel with the the face of the bucket at that point uh, then you're fine so but I like to do it this way because it's just simpler in my brain to do it and for documentation I essentially focus on one cylinder at a time it's just easier for me so this is again number one intake and exhaust there's a good pretty good shot of the uh, actual number one intake left the right one is underneath there you can't see it but there's two cams because there's two valves but you can see this one real clear so basically what you want to do is and I'm gonna have to kind of squeeze in here you address this with a feeler gauge of, of your choice whether imperial or uh, you know metric and you want to get it right in there like that and parallel with that surface of the actual uh, can the bucket you know the, there's a bucket underneath it. it's kind of a flat tappet if you will and then the shim is underneath that which is why you got to snatch the cams out of here to change them um, that's a 6,000 uh, feeler gauge and it fits with a good feel in other words it's not too tight not too loose it's Goldilocks <laughs> and so it's ready that one's good I checked both uh, the intake valves on number one left and right and they are both at six thousandths with good feel so the the um, tolerance is yeah intake the inlet or in, they call it inlet intake is zero zero four seven or just under five thousandths when you're measuring an imperial to just under seven thousandths zero zero six seven so that's six thousand and seven tenths that's four thousand and seven tenths so you essentially got two thousandths uh, playing um, I like to kind of split it in the middle and as I said before, I've checked all of them so far. I will go over the numbers with you shortly. Every one of these is on the tight side, not the loose side. So if you find a, a bike with mostly tight valves, it's a shim type, uh, shim over or under bucket, like depending on when it was made, because it's going to most likely tighten up. All right, maybe, depends. But <clears throat> anyway, this is what we have found. And so um, we're gonna use that 6,000th as a good number which is pretty much where i'd want to be on the in inlet side intake side uh four would definitely even though if, if it was five thousandths it would be technically within tolerance but that's awfully close three tenths is very difficult to measure with a feeler gauge and it's most likely either at or slightly below that four seven and really if you're on the tight side you might as well switch them especially if you got to pull the cams anyway you know so on uh Again, a number one intake, I don't have to touch those uh, buckets or shims, uh, I'm good with that. So let's take a look at how I document this and see what my results were. I call this my way, I'll do it my way. I also did it the service manual way too, but it's, it's relatively very close to the same, so I'm just going to show you these. All right, so starting at number one on the um, inlet side. Um, we have, as I said before, we got six thousands with a good fit on each, so I'm going to leave that one. Now on the exhaust side is a little different. Uh, we're at seven thousands. The standard on that, an Imperial seven and a half to roughly nine and a half thousand. So you have a little more clearance, which is typical on exhaust valves because they generally, uh, because of the heat on the exhaust side, you'll get some expansion of the valve itself lengthwise. That's a good thing to have expansion in the length, isn't it? Uh, also, they tend to kind of close up a little quicker than the intake side on, on some bikes. But uh, yeah, seven and a half to nine and a half. And that means that um, seven thousandths is definitely below and it's a tight fit anyway, because I always note the fit of the feeler gauge. It just gives me a reference to say, is it just barely okay or is it not? And with seven thousand and tight fit, it could very well be 006, eight, you know, eight tenths or something. So it's under. And number two, anything in yellow, as you probably figured out, is um, out of standard, at least in my opinion, if not by the numbers. And you can see number two intake, 004, one's got a tight, one's got a good fit, so that's too tight. I want that at six. And same for number two exhaust. You see one's, one's a good fit at 8,000, so that's where I'd like to have those. And the other one is, um, it's a, I, when I write tight, good fit, it means that it's a tight, you know measurement but the fit is good all right so seven thousandths is definitely on the tight side for where i want it but the fit was good so it's probably an accurate seven thousandths is what that means and the same for number three and four you can kind of get an idea so that's my findings um i like i said i did do it the service manual way they were almost identical a little bit of difference on one or two of them cylinder wise but um for the most part uh i would attribute that maybe to you know 
operator error, just a little different um, technique between one and the other. I, I normally do these twice anyway. I've already done them two times, and my way, that is, and, and I verified all these, so this is what we're gonna go with. And that brings us back here, and that means we gotta pull cams. We'll just release the tension on the uh, tensioner, which is right here. And well, I've already taken off two of the oil crossover. This is actually an oil valve, I believe, for, you know, I, I don't know. This is for the um, variable valve timing. You know, it gets its oil that way, but I guess a certain amount of it bypasses up, and this is for oiling the, uh, the cam bearing surfaces uh, where the cams ride. And so, you know, I've taken two of them out. I will take this one out as well, just to get them out of the way so I can accurately measure. You can't mess those up. They only go one way. So that's it. So what we're going to do is, of course, we are going to refer to the service data, service data, and then see what they say to pull the cams out. Oh my God, that looks, ah, that's easy. This is uh, 5-17 in the, um, I think that's the top end chapter. And camshaft removal, we've done all this crap. We're gonna, I have one or two oil pipes left in there. As you can see, I'm gonna take the rest out here in a minute. All right, so first remove the chain guide. That is this guy right there. And then we're gonna remove, uh, let's see, where, where are you? Next, remove the camshaft caps. First, unscrew the cap bolts, then remove them, yeah. Uh, blah 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 following the sequence and remove the camshaft okay we're going to take the tensioner out too of course uh, i forgot to mention that camshaft chain tensioner removal which i have printed out as well you don't need to see that it's pretty simple so anyway just follow the service data if you're doing this the other thing we'll do is we'll shove a rag down inside this um, tunnel uh, as much as we can keep anything from dropping down there and like i said we'll get the rest of these oil lines out these are oil, you know, they call them oil tubes, but these are real common. You see these a lot on overhead cam uh, motorcycles. One tiny correction, I'm actually gonna put it on top dead center for four here because if I have it on one, number one cylinder, these two marks are pointing at each other when it's the top dead center. And that's impossible to line up the timing marks with the actual cylinder head um, surface, which is what you're supposed to do. So I'm certain that they want you in, in number four top dead center because like I said, that dot is right over there. You're not gonna be able to really do it when it's in the middle here. So even with this pipe out of the way. So my bad, um, you definitely want it on that number four top dead center with these marks opposite each other and with the one and four mark down here, which I have it lined up on the crank. And now we're gonna be ready to do it. Whew, glad I caught that. Although this looks kind of busy, um, it's really set up to do one cam and then the other cam, and it's pretty um, easy to figure out here. The only um, exclusion to that is you're actually taking one and two off, which um, hold that uh, that rub in there, that, uh, what is that, that tensioner bar gizmo, whatever they're calling it, the chain guide. One and two hold the uh, chain guide in. Then all you gotta do is go three to 12 on this side, and it'll take all the, uh, all the bolts out. They are tight, and you gotta watch them locating pins. Two of them got away from me, but I found them. And I have everything stuffed with rags anyway, but they, they want to fly. You got to be really, really careful when you take those off. They don't go somewhere that's really bad. So uh, I have them all accounted for good on the intake side. So as I said, I took them all out. Let me go to the other side and show you a little bit better. Again, all the bolts are out, uh, the caps are out, and I have it set where it needs to be set. I'm not even removing the cam from the chain. I'm just sliding it over to the side like you see it. So really, I'm not gonna lose any timing marks and I'll just re-verify that. So now I can access all the buckets. A little shiny gizmo look like, uh, you know, some sort of coin are the buckets. And you gotta be equally um, cognizant about the shims that are under them. But generally the shims stick to the buckets, especially when you're pulling them out with a magnet because they're thin. I think the magnetism travels through, but also because of the oil. So um, let's take a look at the list and see what we gotta pull. Okay, one intake we're not gonna do. So we're gonna go to two intake and pull uh, one at a time, because uh, I don't want to confuse them. All, the buckets always go back in shims if you're replacing them with the same one, back into the exact place that it came out of. So let's go ahead and do the inlet left, um, and then pull that one out, and then we'll measure up the um, shim, figure out which one it needs. I'm gonna go for inlet left here. Um, I'm gonna have to put the camera down right now because I want both hands available, but this is essentially what you want to do. You just need to pull the bucket out. Sometimes they give you a little hassle because of the oil sticking to it, but that's about it. So again, number two cylinder inlet we are on. 
Okay, there is the inlet number two cylinder left, and you can see that the shim is stuck to the bottom of it. Let's take that shim out and see if it, we can read the number on it. Not gonna really make too much of a difference. I'll explain why, and this is again how I do it. It's not necessarily the way to do it, but this is the way I do it. Looks like it says, I think that's a two and a three. That means it's probably a 2.30 uh, shim, millimeter. Another reason I like to work in Imperial is I mic these things up with an Imperial micrometer and in the thousandths because I'm, I made all my measurements in the thousands. And it's really easy to figure out which shim you want this way, in my opinion. And what we got here is it's, uh, let's see, 75, 85, 90. Looks like 90 thousandths and a half is the thickness of this shim, all right? And then we look again at what we want to achieve. So number two, um, inlet. It's tight. Uh, one's a good fit and one's a tight fit. We need to gain almost 2,000. So then I just find a shim that's um, 2,000 thinner or as close as possible. I pulled out a hot cams shim that's a, what was that, 2.30 in there and I pulled out 2.25. Remember these unfortunately only go in 0 0.05 millimeter increments instead of 0 0.025, but usually you can get away with that. And if you look at the micrometer now, what we have is uh, we have uh, 75, 85, 88 and a half and we are at 90 and a half so pretty much two thousands right on the money or very close within a few tenths so this one we got lucky on and so we'll go ahead and put a 2.25 where a 2.30 used to be now you can see i put next to the uh, that particular left one an additional information that it had a 2.30 in it and i will add probably above that line right there that we changed it over to a 2.25 you know because i want to keep a record of you know what it is now what it was and what it is okay that uh number two intake left is back in and uh be right over there again and so what we're going to do now is um you know we don't have any changes to be made on number one they're both good at six thousand so intake left, now we do intake right. Now I'm not gonna show you all these because it take me all day and I really gotta get this job done. So uh, when we pick back up, I'm going to have all the shims in and the left, or I should say the exhaust side um, taken out. We'll take a quick glance at how that one looks. Evaluate one from that side and then we'll uh, you know, pro I'll probably button everything up and then we'll come back. Okay, so got everything put back. I replaced the shims in the locations that I had measured. And I'm pleased to announce that everything is just about smack dab perfect. Um, there's two that are a little bit, you know, not exactly where I wanted them, but they're so close, probably within a few tenths, um, that I'm not going to worry about it. And, you know, you can get kind of anal about these things. And as long as they're within spec, and I prefer in the middle of the spec or toward the um, larger side, uh, we're good. And that's pretty much where I'm at. So let me show you on the spreadsheet what uh, the numbers are go over the numbers here as you remember if you watched our video before maybe maybe not number one didn't require any adjustment on the inlet side we're gonna go over the inlet first and so six thousandths is fine um, number two was tight at four thousand by the way these are the notes for number two uh, that's why I stuck them in um, basically it had a 2.30 uh, shim in it and actually it had two well, a 2.30 and a 2. Point, probably 27 or something like that. I, I couldn't read it, but based on the numbers, it looked like it was, you know, just a little bit smaller than the one that was in there. Either way, it doesn't matter. It was 4,000, so I wanted it at six. So I put uh, 2.25s in both. I got 6,000, so I'm happy with that. Number three was only tight on the left uh, intake side. The right was fine. And I ended up putting a 2.20 in there, and uh, it had um, uh, 088. I didn't have any room to put what the metric equivalent is in that because UR means unreadable. So it's probably just a little bit, um, you know, bigger than that. But 2.20 may have had a 2.25. I don't know. But either way, again, um, we've got it corrected to six thousandths, but it's just on the tight side, so it may be five. 758 which is a thousandth over minimum which is fine now i i typed this in wrong before i actually deleted this and redid it uh, i looked at this and i corrected it to seven thousandths and i went wait a minute that's under the standard it's seven four to nine four when i liked eight thousandths as a kind of a mid-range and but i just rechecked it and that's where it's at i just typed it wrong 
So I ended up going from a 2.20 to a 2.15, and that's the uh, decimal equivalent for it. So again, I'm at 8 thousandths on that, and I'm happy with that. That is perfectly fine because, uh, you know, it is on the lower side of the scale, but unfortunately, without the 0 0.025 millimeter increments, the next size down, which is the 2.10, um, would have left me with about three or four thousandths to to open. So this is the best I can do right now. And again, it, it's within. The bike's almost got 40k on it, and it was only you know slightly tight. So I'm I'm happy with that. That's going to be fine. Now we'll go over to the exhaust side. And as you recall, if you don't recall, that's fine. Uh, let's skip over to number three. Number three was was perfect it was at eight thousandths and with a good fit of the feeler gauge so we'll i didn't do anything to number three number one exhaust exhaust side here was at seven thousandths which is borderline but you know for me it's it's not good enough i went from a 2.38 to a 2.35 um shim and then it's corrected to eight thousandths uh, the number two exhaust, pretty much the same thing, 2.38 and corrected to 8 thousandths with the same size shim. And we'll skip over to four exhaust. And what we have here is, um, it was at a 2.35 on both of them, 0.93 in an Imperial, 93 thousandths. Uh, I put a 91 in there, 2.30. Um, it's 8 thousandths, but a little bit snug, you know, kind of, basically maybe seven nine yeah it's kind of close to borderline but again it's within and if i went with a 0 0.05 millimeter smaller it would have been out of tolerance so i, I had to shoot for that would have been over the nine and change probably would have been a 10 and change based on the math so i got to work with what i have to work with um and uh, that's it now certainly i could have gone and bought some oem shims once i took it apart but I've used these hot cam shim kits many times. I really like them. They come with a bunch of shims. They're not that expensive, and I've never had any problems with them. Uh, anyway, um, that's where we're at on that. Um, technically, everything is within spec, and, and again, the thing's almost got 40K, and it was just barely under on one and a little bit more than barely under on the other in the exhaust valve, but you know, at 8,000th, we're fine. So that's it in a nutshell. I ended up changing 10 out of the 16 shims, and uh, that is fine. So we're ready to put it back together, like I said, but um, it's just too hot, and it's I'm too tired. Uh, I'm getting old, you know, and it's just hotter than the $3 pistol. I'm actually getting some insulation put in, uh, more insulation, I should say. It's only partially insulated by the previous owners um, out here in the garage. And then I can run at AC, and it'll actually be efficient. Uh, but of course, these contractors, you uh, you sign a contract, send it back in, and then they tell you they can't do it for a month and a half. And I'm like, why don't you hire some people? So, oh well. Middle of September, I'll have that done. They're going to blow some fiberglass in there. I said blow. And then um, that'll be a lot better. It'll be a lot cooler out here for me to work, especially with the door down. I have to have it open now. So anyway, it's, uh, it's done pretty much, except for the reassembly, which I'm not going to film because you don't need to see that you saw the disassembly it's just the reverse of that um, I'm not gonna fill film starting either in case it blows up but I will tell you something if you do this on a concourse 14 and you take out that uh, cam chain tension when you start this thing up for the first time it is going to make a shitload of noise like marbles for a while for a few seconds maybe three four because this um, is a hydraulically assisted cam chain tensioner yes it has a uh, you know the detents in it for a little clip that keeps it from going backwards but it can go backwards a little bit and so it's hydraulically assisted so this thing does not tighten up all the way and that cam chain is flopping around for a few seconds and it's especially uh, noticeable after you replace you know you take the tensioner out so yeah it's going to make some noise. So yeah, uh, okay. So uh, what did I say? I said the 10 shims. Okay, so let's close it out now. Um, appreciate you watching. Hope you got something out of it. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, yada, yada. Get notified when I put something else up. Till next time, we'll catch you on the next video.